Hello and welcome to this very special CNBC broadcast. Now the battle for gateway status between African countries, particularly South Africa and Mauritius, has been going on for a number of years. Now in the past, there was no doubt that South Africa held this throne, but political turmoil, weak economic growth and credit rating downgrades have allowed other countries to catch up. But the question is, are we at a point right now where Mauritius is firmly in the lead as the gateway to Africa? For the next hour, we will address this issue hearing from various voices from the private and the public sectors. Allow me to introduce uh, my panel right now. I'm joined by Matthew Munding, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Standard Chartered Bank Mauritius, Richard Arlov, who's the Chief Executive Officer of ABEX, Ronak Gopaldis, who's the director at Signal Risk, Anthony van Rensburg, who's Group Chief Executive Officer of Foresight Holdings, and also joining us via Skype is Ken Nusami, who is the officer in charge of economic development uh, with the Economic Development Board Mauritius. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for your time. Let's get straight to it. And Matthew, I'll begin with you now. For, for a number of years, we've been speaking about uh, Mauritius and the emerging financial center that it holds. I'd just like to find out, I mean, in your years in uh, the banking industry, are we still at the stage where it is emerging or is the financial center of excellence? in Mauritius right now leading the pack in Africa. Uh, hi, Fifi. Uh, well, thank me for having me in this program. Uh, well, I can definitely say that um, Mauritius is still emerging as an international financial center. Uh, having said that, uh, we've experienced uh, a turbocharge uh, in the reforms of, of the late years, really, uh, whether it comes to uh, good governance, um, the, the ease of doing business, um, the, the infrastructure or, or the regional integration to talk about uh, what I would call the generic attractive I mean factors of attractiveness or competitiveness or um, other specific factors that apply to the financial industry. Uh, you know, like for instance, as we speak, um, Mauritius is, the, uh, is one of the only three um, African countries that are investment grade uh, absolutely, which is which is just a fact. Yeah. Uh, yes, and the Mauritius, you know, you have you, you, you we can name them. You have uh, uh, the free flow of capital. You can bring your money in, in and out into mm -hmm. the country. Uh, you have a bilingual workforce. There are a lot of these. So I mean, uh, I hope we have to develop all these, obviously, because usually the question that uh, people are asking uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, why coming to Mauritius? You know, uh, to use Mauritius at the gateway to Africa. And the other question is, why is Standard Chartered? Right. Um, Let's deal with why Mauritius is the gateway to Africa first. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, that's why I say that, uh, in fact, Mauritius, w when you look at it from, as I said, uh, the good governance, the, the, the ease of doing business, the infrastructure, the, the regional integration, Mauritius stands out in Africa. And I would just like to tell one story before I pose the, for, for my other colleagues. I was actually stunned with what um, uh, the country did last year in the space of the World Bank doing business, uh, where uh, in the 2017 uh, World Bank doing business ranking, Mauritius was 49, um, you know, globally. Obviously, Mauritius always leads the way in Africa, but it was 49 globally. But uh, the country under the leadership of the government with the private sector, um, the uh, civil society and the agencies came together, uh, wrote the Business Facilitation Act, which led to Mauritius jumping from the 40 nine to 25 ranking, you know. Uh, in the world. In the world. Mm -hmm. Mauritius, which is an African country, is now the 25th country now in globally in terms of the ease of doing business. And, and this is a very compelling story because, you know, when I, when I got to Mauritius, uh, partially due to my previous experience with Singapore, I was very demanding when it comes to reforms. Um, and and I, was, I, was, I was calling for uh, the scale, the scope, and the speed of the reforms. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy to see that it's happening. Oh, it is happening. Richard, over to you. Now, you've got a very interesting view of the gateway uh, status. Uh, just tell us a little bit why about, you don't necessarily believe in a gateway, uh, but do share. Yeah, I think it's been, well, the, the, the word gateway has been used extensively, but I think it may not mean the same thing to all of us. So I think this is why I'd like to qualify a little bit. A gateway gives that uh, impression of like it's a, it's a through, you know. 
money comes in as a financial center, money comes in and goes off. And there's no substance which is added in the country. Whereas I think what Mauritius has been doing and, and, and strives to continue to do is effectively to make sure that the business is more done from Mauritius mm -hmm. than just through Mauritius. And that's important, especially in these days where we are talking of BEPS, which is the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, which is an OECD initiative which wants to make sure that uh, countries pay their fair uh, uh, share of taxation, and taxation is paid where substantial activity and economic activity is happening. So Mauritius as a financial center effectively wants business to be done from the country with the right amount of substance from the country. So yes, it can be seen as a gateway, provided the word gateway is coupled with the right amount of substance in the country. And what the country has been doing, I think Mathieu has been talking about ease of doing business, it's also about how can you, from Mauritius, have the right people, the right capabilities, the HR capabilities to do business on the continent. How can you raise finance from the country, from Mauritius, to do business in Africa. So all these elements are such that, and also where are you your decisions made? For example, for us at ABAX, this is mainly what we do. We need to make sure that our clients that are registered in Mauritius to do business outside of Mauritius have the right level of governance, have the right level of compliance, or doing business from the country on to the continent. And also maybe the, the, the word gateway for a continent, we must view it as well <coughs> about what it, what it brings to the mind of people. It looks as if business is always coming from outside of the continent onto the continent so that Mauritius is a gateway to the continent. Whereas what we are seeing, and maybe Mathieu can confirm this as well, as much as there's a lot of business coming from outside of the continent, there's an enormous amount of intra-Africa business. Sure. So yes, it can be the gateway, but within the continent itself. Lots of business from South Africa. We're seeing also now some other countries being capital exporting countries, countries of the continent, mm -hmm. doing business within the continent. And so Mauritius is a gateway, but with the right substance, and also to foster business intra-Africa as well. I mean, Aronik, in your uh, role and now where you're answering a lot of questions from business people looking to operate here on the, qu on the continent, they're looking for you know, the risk-reward uh, balance. When it comes to Mauritius, so what do you tell them? So before I get there, I just want to touch on something that, that was raised by, by Ris Richard, this, this concept of a gateway, because hmm. you know, it's, a, it's a term that's bandied about quite often. And fought for. African exactly. countries fight for it. But we don't really know what, what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in my mind, it's an operational base which can facilitate business and economic activities across the entire continent. And within that, you've got, you've got distinctions. So you can be a financial gateway, but you can also be a physical gateway, mm -hmm. right? And I think Mauritius ticks a few boxes on one front, but not so many on the other. So here I want to bring in the comparison of, of South Africa versus Mauritius. Now, why is Mauritius an attractive gateway option from a financial perspective. Double taxation agree agreements, uh, you know, easy place to do business, political stability, stable currency, all of these things are, are the kind of ingredients that businesses like uh, to operate within. But it, it does have a number of structural flaws in its economy that we need to address, right? For one, it's a small open economy and it's an island. So you'll never get the scale that a South Africa can offer you. Secondly, connectivity is an issue. So I know the Asia-Africa corridor was, was launched uh, some time ago, but the reality is that if you want to get from Mauritius to Lagos, you have to come via Joburg mm -hmm. or via Dubai or via Kenya. So you know, that, that is a major constraint. So now, you know, we, we, we frame this as a competition between South Africa and, uh, and Mauritius, whereas mm -hmm. I think the two can complement each other. Right, so you know, on the one hand, any serious player in, in, in Africa will probably need to be in both countries. South Africa, for example, can offer you port access to the Atlantic Ocean and the, and the uh, Indian Ocean. We've got ports in Cape Town, we've got ports in Durban. So for example, if you're, if you're exporting goods to, to Ghana, it's much more effective to do it out of, out of Cape Town. You know? um, South Africa gives you scale, gives you soft power, it gives you various elements that you don't get with with Mauritius. Uh, and I think on that basis, we need, we need to understand what Mauritius offers 
Um, and, and the country has typically been very good at boxing smart. Uh, and I think, you know, putting it in perspective on, on that front where South Africa can offer kind of trade physical kind of, kind of elements, whereas Mauritius is most certainly a financial gateway, I think is, is an important clarification. Uh, so Antonia, Ronica is saying that any serious player needs to have uh, feet in both countries, Mauritius and South Africa. You've positioned yourself well in both countries. Yes. Can you tell us on how you're leveraging on those two relationships, particularly your listing on uh, the JSC's yes. uh, alternative exchange? Yes. I think basically um, everybody's really set uh, what we have ex experienced in practice. Mm -hmm. Um, when we started up the, the, the entity, we, we had a look at a number of options in terms of growing the company across the emerging markets on a global scale. Um, and we were very, very fortunate to, 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 to um, acquire assets inside Mauritius. And basically what everybody has said is what we are experiencing um, after the, we've done the acquisition last year. So, you know, for practically, I'm a business person. So what do business people want? They want to have easy access to capital. Um, they want to be able to do business, grow value um, for, for their stakeholders. And I'm a firm believer that if you grow value for your stakeholders, those people take that value back into the communities and they change their societies. Mm -hmm. So that for me is a pure, a pure principle around why do we do business? So having Looking at both worlds, what we did was we did acquire this, um, the um, assets in Mauritius. Our head office is established in Mauritius. We do employ uh, 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 local people. Uh, we've got also ac expats in the, in the business. And when you look at all of these things, you know, I can practically say to you, the first one, why, why do you want to do business in both worlds? For us, there were two reasons. The one was we had to get access to capital. What we found was that um, in our st global strategy that we want to execute, it was easier to raise capital in our networks in South Africa, mm -hmm. but utilizing Mauritius as a, not as a gateway, but as a platform for our expansion across the world. So currently we operate in 25 countries worldwide. 15 of those are in Africa. So the question is naturally, how do we reach all of those countries with skills, uh, with our technology, all of that? And that became a very logical choice of saying, from a geographical perspective, use Mauritius as a, as, 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 as a base point into Africa and Asia where we operate. Now, for me, if I look at this as a business person, what do I want? I want to operate in an environment where I feel the taxes I pay is, is, is fair. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we found in Mauritius. There's, everybody feels it's a fair deal in terms of what we pay from a personal perspective and what we pay from a, from, from, a, from, a, from a business perspective. There's really no discussion or issue around that you, what we get from, 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 from the country is unfair in terms of what we pay. So that's a very, very big driver for us as a business. The second one, I think, and I've already mentioned the geographical positioning for us where we move across the world in emerging markets, using that as a base. And I think the most important thing that, we've all, that we also did consider was that when you do business uh, inside, uh, inside a specific regulatory environment, do we have to encounter things like corruption and crime and all of those type of things that people typically deal with? And quite honestly, this was a very, very interesting one for me, having oper or op operating then employing people in, in the office is that what I've discovered there that it's not negotiable to, um, mm -hmm. to, 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 to face uh, questions around corruption and crime. It's not an issue. The fabric of, of the people in Mauritius, they don't tolerate that. They, or, or what I've seen there, my experience with our board members, our people working there, is they're actually very proud Mauritians. Sure. They're very well educated. Mm -hmm. um, they really want to enhance their capabilities. Um, and the people are very... They can speak English, so we've got a very nice discussion, and we actually operate from that base. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, as a business person, I suddenly I sit with people that are proud of who they are, they want to do business, they are well educated. And of course, a country that in 2016 was ranked number one in the Mo Ibrahim Index of, of, of African governance, so they're speaking exactly, to exactly. a very uh, yeah. so, <laughs> corrupt, yeah. uh, free environment. Yes. But, uh, you know, Anthony, let me just bring Ken into this uh, right okay. now. And uh, Ken, uh, tell us a little bit more about this new uh, department or this new entity that the government of Mauritius has uh, set up of economic uh, development there of Mauritius. 
Why now and what, are the, what, what is it aiming or hoping to achieve? Thank you very much. Uh, before I answer this question, let me uh, also um, say that, you know, for, for us uh, in Mauritius, we believe strongly in a, in a very strong region. So prosperity, uh, stability, whether it is economic, political or social for the region is important. So we view that, you know, uh, it is important that we complement each other. Uh, and how do we mobilize investment? Uh, for the good of our people, but also for the continent. Now, the Economic Development Board is basically um, an announcement made in the budget. We've seen that it is important that we have a single message that comes across internationally when we're promoting. So the Economic Development Board uh, is actually integrating uh, the Board of Investment, the Enterprise Mauritius and Financial Services Promotion Agency, precisely to bring under one roof uh, equivalence in terms of uh, promotion, visibility and awareness uh, globally. But added to that, it is important also to underscore that the Economic Development Board today has a huge task of looking at strategic planning, where the country uh, is heading in the future, what strategy we should adopt, how do we harness opportunities across so that Mauritius can become a high income economy. This year, we are going to celebrate 50 years uh, anniversary of our independence. And when we look back, Mauritius has gone a long way. We have actually um, done a lot of progress. We have diversified the economy. We are very resilient. A number of sectors that contribute to the economic prosperity of the country. But moving forward now, it is important for us to make certain strategic choices. Uh, we talk about doing business. We want to continue to progress. We want to make sure that the country is business friendly, that we are attracting the right kind of industries in Mauritius, that we continue to build that ecosystem, that we invest further in the human capacity, which is very important for us if we want to build higher efficiency in all the sectors of the economy. So the Economic Development Board is an answer uh, to that um, sort of challenge for us. There is also another aspect to it, which is about licensing. We talked about the, um, you know, the need for a, a business friendly and, and a seamless uh, sort of business environment for people to operate in. And one of the mandates of the Economic Development Board also is to look at how we can continue to create that synergy in terms of private sector government, create an ecosystem where, you know, in terms of people coming to work and live in Mauritius, it's much easier for them. They have just one stop shop. So the Economic Development Board has this huge mandate. And I would say that, you know, um, we, we've come uh, to, to a situation today where uh, these strategic choices are becoming very important for us. Uh, what sectors we want to promote, how do we want to promote them, what kind of visibility we want globally uh, becomes important for a small country like Mauritius. And therefore, you know, uh, the Economic Development Board has, has been set up. And there's a lot of hope in terms of how do we create that synergy and move Mauritius to that high income economy um, in the next few years. For sure. And that's the thing, though, because the size of Mauritius also in uh, relation to other African countries always comes up in uh, this, this, this debate of gateway. And I, I'm really interested in you, Mathieu, uh, operating a, a global uh, bank or under a global brand there, standard chartered. I mean, what kind of growth are you able to achieve in such a small country? Uh, actually, uh, this, is, this is a very, a very interesting question. Um, w we are in Mauritius uh, uh, today, Standard Chartered, uh, the only global bank uh, bullish on the African continent with a presence in Mauritius. Because in our industry, so that everybody understands, in our industry, you know, you're not global if you're not operating in the top five global financial centers of the world. There are London, New York, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo as, on, as the latest ranking. And from that perspective, you've got four global banks there in Mauritius. Only Standard Chartered is bullish on the continent. It's in Punta Rays 10 days. Um, through our you know, coverage of the continent, we present in 15 market, footprint market. Uh, we support 22 other markets through our NPC strategy. But if you look also, I mean, the uh, product offering across the continent, it's, it's, it's very important. So we're not looking for Mauritius, that's what I'm saying, as a destination country. That's why where the, the, the aspect of gateway is important. Mm -hmm. we, we're looking for Mauritius as a, a gateway to, you know, more than 500 million 
uh, consumer market in Southern Africa, East Africa, but also the network that Mauritius gives to the, to the rest of the world. And, and precisely in Mauritius, what we're doing there at Standard Chartered, we are, we are leveraging on the franchise to maximize the value to network. That's very important. We're delivering the network. And the network at Standard Chartered means Asia, Africa, and the Middle East primary target. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and that, this, is what, this is what we're doing. And one of our, we obviously we have, uh, we have a, a, a compelling uh, uh, we have a compelling value proposition, but the leading va value proposition is our RTC, which is the Regional Treasury Center, uh, which is basically we are we are we are actually seeing uh, corporate coming from Asia, from Europe, America, and from Africa, setting their uh, Regional Treasury Center for their operations in Africa. Mm. And 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 why Standard Chartered? I mean, we have the systems of a global bank, we have uh, we have the technology of the global bank, the leading global bank, we have the people. Uh, and we we combining that to deliver besides this leading solution to uh, to our client. And uh, we're talking. To, uh, Richard was talk, to, talking about the African uh, companies uh, using Mauritius. In fact, it's a very very interesting development because uh, this model is referred to as the uh, China Hong Kong model, where you see uh, Chinese companies uh, putting their RTC in Hong Kong for their non-Chinese business. Equally, you're seeing African companies, whether they're from South Africa or Nigeria or other African markets, putting their, uh, their RTC in Mauritius for their non-domestic business. So we are not sure. competing, actually, because as we all know, uh, Africa come up with huge uh, business opportunity, huge economic opportunity, but fragmented mm -hmm. across 54 jurisdictions, 30 million square kilometers. So from that standpoint, Mauritius as an entering point is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So as I said, Mauritius is my, actually we're using it as a gateway. In fact, my domestic business in Mauritius is less than 5%. Uh, my business is, is fundamentally network business. For sure, I mean, I mean, like uh, many say that uh, FDI is an indicator of a country that has a gateway status if we stick to the traditional uh, definition of it. And a country like Mauritius has see been seeing increasing flows there versus a South Africa where uh, some say we are an investment uh, recession. But as uh, the increase of uh, capital, particularly from Asia, right, comes into the continent now, I'm just really interested, I mean, Richard, in your role, where, where, where are you seeing that capital finding a home or searching for a home mm. yeah I mean it's it's varied but I think there's one also, also one interesting point we're talking about numbers and FDI mm. <coughs> I think the role of a financial of an international financial center is precisely to help effectively to help financial FDI flow into a country you see, for many years, Mauritius was not at all in the international business. The whole thing started around 1992. You know, before that, in the 1970s and 80s, our tax rate, for example, personal tax rate was 70%, mm -hmm. 70. And now it's gone down to 15. And uh, government is collecting much more taxation from everybody. And similarly, the country has opened up in 1992, and once it started to do that, then Mauritius has become an international financial center, and Mauritius has helped uh, FDI flow into India. For many years, for over 20, 20 years, Mauritius has been and still is the major financial center, a major investor into India. Mm. So similarly, Mauritius wants to do the same thing for Africa. Okay, facilitating the flow of FDI into the countries. And this is why a financial, an international financial center like Hong Kong for China, like London and some other, uh, Frankfurt and so on for Europe, is extremely important for the development of a region because it helps the financial flows to get into and out of other countries. So Mauritius has played that role. And if you look today at the figures, our GDP, is about 12 to 13 billion dollars, the GDP of the country. Sure. It's a small country with 1.3 million people. And, uh, but if you look at the assets, the value of the assets under administration that are administered in the Mauritius companies that are then investing outside of Mauritius is 550 billion. Mm. So that's about 40 times the GDP. So that's how, how much the international players have confidence in Mauritius to put their money through the Mauritian banks, the board decisions made through the boards that sit in Mauritius, 
to invest outside of, of, of Mauritius. So when you say what are the countries that, uh, that, that are attracting these FDIs and so on, these are many countries on the continent. Okay? Whichever countries are effectively want to attract the FDI, Mauritius wants to add value, especially in terms of governance. I think what we are seeing today is that countries on the continent have lots of projects in Africa, infrastructure, uh, mining, uh, telecommunication, FMCG, agriculture, whatever you, you name it. But the difficulty many businesses have is what at Abax we call a governance gap. Sure. So you have many people who've got projects who want to attract money from the private equity funds, from people from Asia, or from people from Africa, or from the banks, or raise money on the stock exchange, but the governance is not there. I mean, They've got two books of account and so on. So when we talk to them, we try to explain to them that if you don't have the right level of governance, you're talking a different language. So we have to Can I drill in onto that. this issue of governance? Because Rona, I mean, being a South African, you know uh, that we you know, don't rank number one or probably number 10 uh, place when it comes to uh, governance. But you also deal with a lot of African countries uh, across the, the continent, and governance is also an issue uh, across the continent. Do you think that Mauritius can really play that leading role in advising uh, African countries on this very important uh, topic of governance? Look, I mean, first up, there's an important caveat that, uh, you know, each country is sovereign, uh, and it's up to their people to decide how they want to be governed. Um, but I do think Mauritius has a number of distinct comparative advantages, and governance is definitely one of them. So routinely top the Heritage Foundation, Mo, Mo Ibrahim Index, World Bank, ease of doing business rankings for the continent. Um, in addition to that, you've got free movement of people, of capital, of, of goods in Mauritius, which is, which is very important. And if you compare and you contrast that to South Africa again, you know, we've got political volatility in South Africa. Currency is the most volatile in, in the world. Um, you've got a lack of policy synergy and a much more protectionist orientation mm -hmm. in terms of the policy. So if you're a business person and you're an investor uh, and Mauritius is wide open, it's liberal, um, suddenly you're, you're very attracted to it. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the other comparative advantages in, in Mauritius, and this I think is a lesson to a lot of policymakers on the rest of the continent, is how pragmatic and how nimble the policymakers have been. 50 years ago, this was a sugar crop. They moved to textiles, then they moved to tourism, then they moved to a financial sector, and now with Vision uh, 2030, the country is looking to become a more innovative economy, you know, with an ocean, ocean economy, with, with an Africa strategy. So, you know, very creative, very innovative, very clever, uh, and that's been very successful in, in diversifying. Remember, this is a very vulnerable uh, economy because it's a small open island which is subject to global shocks like Brexit, like like the U.S. Um, you know trade trade uh, agreements being mm -hmm. revoked. So Mauritius has adapted ahead of the curve, and you know when we had a commodity route in Africa starting in the middle of 2014, you know what happened to Nigeria, you know what happened to Angola. Mm. Uh, suddenly these boom bust scenarios uh, caught these countries uh, with their pants down, and Mauritius is very good at at being pragmatic and and being ahead of the curve. Uh, at adapting. I think the other thing that, that was, was really a standout example in terms of Mauritius's evolution as an economy is when they got independence, they invested heavily in education and healthcare. Now, given our demo demographic challenges across the continent, uh, you know, this is a, a shining example because now you've got people in Mauritius who are educated, who are bilingual, who can work in call centers, who can, can who are add. Healthy. Who are wealthy, moving to a, a higher income economy now. Uh, you know, you've got people who, who can add value in, in a back office. Uh, so the skills are there. And I think, you know, our big challenge uh, as Africans is that we need to create jobs for people and you need the soft infrastructure, the healthcare and the education to do that. And, and Mauritius has done extremely well on, on that front. Well, Ronak, let's leave it there uh, for now. Let's take a quick uh, break when we return. More on uh, Mauritius as a gateway to Africa. Stay with us.
Well, hello and welcome uh, back. Uh, you still tuned into the CNBC Africa special on Mauritius, and we have been uh, for the past uh, half hour or so debating whether it is the gateway into uh, Africa or the springboard into uh, uh, doing c uh, business on the continent, as many uh, would uh, say. Uh, so, we're just kicking it off uh, from where we left off, and Antony, I'd like to begin with you because uh, a thing that's been mentioned about Mauritius is the fact, or oh, you mentioned it, in mm. fact, uh, you know, good uh, g governance structures. Uh, corruption not really being a problem. Mm. In South Africa now, we've recently had a, a change. We've had new leadership come in to inject new optimism of uh, corruption in the future not being so much of a problem. We've mm. seen it's being dealt with uh, uh, a little yes. bit, but yeah. there's, a, there's a confidence yeah. that it will be uh, dealt with further. You yes. came here, you listed on the JSC, you came to tap into a wider pool of investors, raise uh, capital mm. here. I'm really interested in, you know, the money that you've been able to raise. Uh, how where are you looking for acquisitions? And uh, this, this new dawn that's taking place in a country like South Africa, is, is it inspiring confidence to perhaps also park your money here versus just growing in Mauritius? Yes, I think it's a very, very, very good question. So we've seen this optimism that started to, you know, to sweep over South Africa. Now, from our perspective, the reason why we, we did an inward listing was purely because of the ability to raise capital in South Africa. Now that capital has been applied in both countries, so we believe there is, on the one side, it is for us from a geographical perspective, the, the gateway into the rest of our markets um, in, um, in, in, in Asia, in, in Africa. So we're applying our capital in terms of expansion into those markets using, um, using the local capability in Mauritius to do that. Um, establishing our competency centers in that in, in specific country. Then from a South African perspective, we are also using the capital um, 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 in this perspective to acquire assets um, in South Africa that we do believe will create a, a, a advantage for us uh, from a global perspective. So our focus is global. Uh, mm. We play in a technology game, that's why I don't have a tie in here. Uh, <laughs> and, but, but from that perspective, we're looking, as a business person, we're looking at the best return on assets that we can get. Mm -hmm. and, and that includes um, the skills, it includes the product, the service, and the markets. So we we're using both of the countries to our advantage to, to grow value across the world. Sure. Uh, and uh, sorry, yeah, let's, no, just, let's just bring uh, Ken back into this. Ken, uh, uh, thanks for your time uh, still. Uh, Mauritius, for most people, right, is known as a tourist hotspot. You see the sun and the beaches and the pina coladas and all of that. So I'm just uh, very interested to know that in this new uh, body that the government has established, how do you intend on changing that perception or balancing that perception, as Matthew has said here in studio? Thank you for this question. In fact, when you look at the economic structure of Mauritius, uh, although we are known for being a tourist destination, tourism accounts for roughly around 7% of GDP. Uh, we talked about the financial services, it accounts for 12% of GDP. Uh, the manufacturing sector still contributes to 14%. So I would say that we have successfully been able to tran uh, transform that, you know, that so that perception to some extent. But I agree with you that internationally, globally, people know Mauritius for being a tourist destination, which is true, in fact. We've got, we have to leverage on, on the assets of the country. Now, moving forward, we are also looking at how do we uh, position within uh, the embassies and the missions uh, that we have outside of Mauritius, economic counselors. The role of the economic counselors would basically be to really provide um, uh, a sort of reach to the investor community, change that perception that Mauritius means business, that we are looking for investment, we're looking at markets to export our products, and we also want Mauritius to become that services gateway. And the Economic Development Board is going to give all the support uh, to that initiative. Over and above, we're going to engage in a campaign of visibility and awareness to create that simple message about Mauritius been open for business, that Mauritius wants to attract um, opportunities, wants to attract uh, investment, and also uh, businesses uh, in all the different sectors that we are, we are promoting. So I would say that, uh, from, that from that angle, uh, we, we want to create that coherent message uh, about Mauritius. We want to make sure that there is alignment within all the institutions within Mauritius so that single message goes out 
to the investor community, to the trading community. At the same time, we are also um, uh, engaging into um, opening our markets, creating a greater synergy. So we are now in the process of concluding a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with India. We're looking at China. We have an FTA with Turkey and also with Pakistan. We already very much uh, linked uh, uh, on the continent, and we are also looking at economic partnership agreement with uh, with Europe and the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. What that means is that we are looking at how our Mauritian entrepreneurs, businesses, could have a leverage in terms of market access, and this is important for investors because although Mauritius is small, when you're looking at the bigger picture we already have access to 26% of the world population in terms of market access through our linkages with these uh, different agreements. So I would say that there's a lot going for us and we would be very aggressive in the years to come to position Mauritius as this platform for business. Well, other countries certainly have to be aware for that aggressive uh, strategy there to drive that growth. Uh, Matthew, so Mauritius, uh, fantastic tax laws, uh, fantastic uh, tax environment or business environment uh, for uh, companies to set up and grow. But then there's also that uh, overhang or that perception of Mauritius being a tax haven. I mean, is this true from doing business on the ground there? Well, Fifi, it's indeed... Um a question that comes often when we go out um, selling Mauritius, whether in, in Asia, in Europe, or at time even in Africa. And, and, and I must say that, uh, personally, I don't believe that that is a fair uh, statement. But, but what is even more important is what the country has done recently uh, to, to mitigate that reputation. Because fundamentally, you know, we're touching on the reputational pillar of the factors of attractiveness mm -hmm. of, of any given uh, international financial center. And the, the, the challenge around uh, the, the tax event tag was actually across three, uh, I would say, bullet points. Uh, tax transparency and sharing of information, uh, uh, minimum implementation of BEPS, as Richard said early on, and uh, fair taxation or uh, harmful tax practices. Those were the three. Uh, a bullet point that the country has to address. And I'm actually happy to say that, you know, on the 5th of July, uh, the country signed uh, MLI uh, with 43 minus 19 uh, DTS country because we, we discovered 19 DTA countries for bilateral negotiations. Mm -hmm. That would be, that would also be dealt with by the end of 2018. So that one is done. Uh, we talk about MLI, which is basically uh, avoiding, you know, treaty abuses, mm -hmm. uh, like round tripping of money. And, and precisely, uh, uh, like Richard said, the creation of substance, moving from you know kind of share companies into actual create creation of of substance in the given economy. So that was, was done on the fifth of, of July. On the twenty first of August, I talk about last year, uh, Mauritius was declared by OECD uh, a, a a a tax compliance country from from uh, information sharing transparency perspective. Um, the the item which is left on the on the radar, which is being worked currently is around uh, fair taxation or harmful tax, tax, tax practices, which has to do with what we call the DIM foreign tax credit. Uh, and again, a, a, a work has been done for that, that to, be, to be addressed. And, and if I may just expand a little bit, uh, uh, because one thing that comes also around that, which I hear often from some uh, NGOs in, in African countries, where they're saying that uh, Mauritius might be uh, eating some African countries' lunch, if I put it that way. Now, uh, I, was, I want to say this, uh, you know, if you look at what Richard said earlier on, over the last 15 years, India have got uh, 300 billion worth of FDI. A third of it has transited via Mauritius, 100 billion. The second next channel was Singapore, 47 billion. But is that not because of the uh, location, the fact that, uh, you know, India and Mauritius are just... Located, no, no, it's, it's no, easier, no, the uh, geographic location. There's, there's, there's part of it, there's part of it, identity, as we will say, but the, a lot also actually goes on the back of the DTA, mm -hmm. the, form, the, for the former DTA, as we said. But what I would like, what I would like to say here is that what, what I actually told people, which, which is true, is that uh, with capital flows comes, you know, technical assistance, a training capacity building, which means that actually Mauritius has played a very important role in the economic and industrial development of India. Right. And what Mauritius is trying to do today is replicate the same model with Africa. So there's a lot for Africa to be gained there. 
Obviously, we understand. I mean, this, the, the challenge around, you know, the, as I said, fair taxation, minimum implementation of BEPS, and uh, the 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 the, uh, the tax transparency. But we also need to look at the bigger picture. What actually, once you fix those aspects, what more issues could do for, for Africa? If I may just uh, uh, develop again back to Stanchard before landing. You remember I, 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 I spoke about a leading value proposition, which is RTC. I mean, I'm actually happy to see that we have a full-fledged bank there in, in Mauritius, where we are the fourth uh, 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 security service hub of Standard Chartered. We are in Mauritius. The other would be in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai. And we're supporting 40 markets across the globe, most of them being in Africa. Hmm. We, we are, I mean, we, we, we see increasing investors and investors companies coming to Mauritius, using Mauritius, not just as a liquidity management platform, as we said, but as the investment vehicle in, for investing into Africa. We still supporting African markets to what we call OBL, offshore booking location. I mean, uh, you name them, Nigeria, Angola, Tanzania, in addition to India. We're supporting uh, uh, African banks when it comes to, you know, trade, trade loan facility, trade facilities or trade confirmation of lands, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a lot is being done in that space, which has to be considered over and above the reputation that we were, we, we were, we were facing when we're going out, uh, uh, you know, marketing more issues. But I'm happy to see that things are actually changing. Oh, so things are changing. I mean, Richard, for, you know, we talk about entrepreneurs being the ones that are really going to push the African continent forward. So we talk about an entrepreneur who happens to be watching us right now and thinking, okay, um, what yeah. opportunities lie there for me and my business there in Mauritius on the ground? What do you say to those people? Mm. In fact, what we, for us, the sweet spot of, 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 of clients and, and people who can gain from being in Mauritius is effectively entrepreneurs. It's not only entrepreneurs, but it's effectively entrepreneurs, private equity funds, and these private equity funds very often, very often are looking to channel their funds into the businesses that are effectively run by entrepreneurs, and also multinationals. But what we see is, I'm not going to answer your question in relation to business in Mauritius, not entrepreneurs doing business in Mauritius, but using the Mauritius platform to do business outside. So, why is an entrepreneur? Take, for example, a South African entrepreneur doing well in his business. Maybe they've developed a software or something, and they've done very well in their own country, and they want to access a wider reach, to have a wider reach in terms of market reach. They want to go north, as they say from here, so to access the continent. So from there, once you decide that you want to do business in a number of different countries, you have to find a home for your headquarters. Where do you want to place your headquarters? You can keep it in Johannesburg, right? But you can also see whether there's any area, any place, any financial center where together with Johannesburg, you can add to it so that it becomes more efficient. Mm -hmm. So our value proposition, increasingly for Mauritius, is what is, what are the elements or components that are going to affect your enterprise value? Mm -hmm. For any entrepreneur, what you're looking at really is how much profit I'm doing, how can I benefit the society, how can I have a more efficient treasury management, and how can I look at in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, how do I create value? Mm. So in that, in that enhancement of enterprise value, Mauritius has a number of advantages it can offer. Mm -hmm. If you look at these components of value, a lot of it is linked to the efficiency of operations. Once is you're going to do these operations in Tanzania, in Malawi, in Cote d'Ivoire, but how do you look at enhancing and facilitating the decisions that you make? How are you going to place your shared, shared where, where is your procurement, for example, your central procurement for your products? How do you manage all the cash that comes from different countries? All these merchants have advantages of providing. I mentioned governance. It's not about governance of the countries, but it's corporate governance. How sure. does corporate governance drive value if I'm today able to talk to people like Stanchard or the private equity funds and raise money at a low, low cost of, of interest? How does that benefit me as an entrepreneur? My intellectual property, where do I register it? Where do I protect it? So all these components of enterprise value, Mauritius can help. So that's why, effectively, for an entrepreneur who wants to go international outside his own country, looking at a financial center such as Mauritius, but there are other financial centers as well, 
does make a lot of sense. All right, let's, so let's balance it a little bit now. Uh, uh, Ronak, uh, give us the other side of the story. For you, you say there's a little bit of a, a crisis of identity that uh, Mauritius is suffering from. Explain. Yeah, so what I mean by that is that there's this perception that Mauritian firms are really good at talking the talk, but when it comes to walking the walk, uh, they're very fearful and they panic when doing business in Africa. And, you know, it's, it's only a recent phenomenon that, that Mauritius has pivoted towards the rest of the African continent. Historically, the relationships have been with the UK, with Europe, with India. So now, you know, you, you ask yourself the question, economically, Mauritius identifies with Africa, but culturally, given the ethnic makeup of the country, is there not a greater affiliation to, to Asia and mm. the likes of India? So that's what I mean by an identity crisis. And if you look at the examples of Mauritian companies that have done business in Africa, a lot of them have been burnt. Now that may be through naivety, not having the right local partners, through a, a number of reasons, but the, the reality is that I think there's a lack of cultural symmetry in the sense that Mauritian businesses, when doing business in Africa, uh, still have a lot to learn in that in that front, and hopefully that's where an organisation like mine can can hey. add some value. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose the same could be said about South African companies. A number of South African of companies mm. doing business in the rest of the continent have been burnt. But so Mauritius has also got the language advantage. I mean, English, French, uh, French. I understand it's a second it's a second spoken um, most language on the continent. We don't have that, so surely that bats in their favour. Sure, right? but but you know the soft stuff is really important, right? So you know, same thing with the perception issue that it's cocktails and coconuts and honeymoon destination and the, the same thing with the transparency. These are issues that have got to be addressed in, if you're going to be effective in doing business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the identity gap, the way, the way Mauritius relates with the rest of the African continent plus this perception gap, for me, are, are two of the less tangible things that we need to address, but very important nonetheless. I mean, Anthony, you, you've spoken about the perks of doing business in uh, Mauritius, but perhaps let's just uh, balance it out. What could this new um, economic development board that has been set up to uh, facilitate more uh, business people coming into the country to use it as a springboard to the continent, what should or what could it be doing more of to attract that business? Um, I think in terms of your questions, I want to go back to uh, what my two colleagues spoke about. I sure. think, again, from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, what was said, that is actually what we experience. Uh, we really experience all the benefits and all the advantages around that. I can't really comment around the identi identity crisis because we sit between two countries, so <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I don't suffer from that yet. Uh, we already operate. So. But I think in terms of, um, from, 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 from a company perspective, to be quite honest, there was one reason why we didn't last, uh, list on the Mauritian stock market exchange, due to liquidity, and we, we sat in and said we couldn't raise the cash from, um, from, from the, you know, what is available in Mauritius. And I think that's one of the things that when we move into the country, when an entrepreneur moves into the country, what assistance can be given to somebody like us to actually use and open up all the rest of the markets. So we haven't really engaged in that model. How can they help? They can help us to grow the business. Because again, what I've said is that if I grow my business, uh, I share my wealth with my stakeholders, it changes the society. Mm -hmm. So that's the purpose for doing that, is to help me to grow the business. And I think right now at this point in time, is, you know, we haven't really experienced any of those assistance from, you know, from, a, from, from, from a company that moved in and acquired assets in there. Would I like to have a discussion? Really, yes, I would like to have that discussion. Perfect platform to have yep. that discussion. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Ken, uh, I'm very interested in your views of Rwanda. I mean, how are you viewing that uh, country right now? Uh, particularly the uh, meeting that took place between uh, the president of Rwanda and uh, the president of the US there in, uh, in uh, the World Economic Forum meetings there at Davos. I mean, many would say that that uh, President Trump only met with uh, Kigama there is very telling of where America sees up opportunities on the continent. Uh, wh wh what's your view? Well, as I said, you know, each country is sovereign and they have their own strategy. And of course, as you know, a continent, it's good to see that there is progress. We uh, tend to believe that we have our own compelling advantages, which we want to leverage on. And our compelling advantage is that we have already created an ecosystem in Mauritius where we are becoming a services-based platform for global businesses to uh, do business. And uh, we tend to believe that this is uh, one of the key factors that drive investment, that helps 
to boost confidence in investors. Of course, we're looking at how uh, we can bring more value. Uh, we don't have any specific view about, you know, Rwanda, uh, other than to say, you know, it, it's it's fair competition. It is something which we want. We see Africa progressing. We have our own Africa strategy. And when we see South-South cooperation, uh, we feel that it, it is important that all the countries within Africa come united and work together uh, with each other. I would say that at the time when I was at the Board of Investment, we had peer-to-peer -peer learning. And it's good that, you know, uh, we learn from the mistakes of others and that we bring uh, on board so that, uh, those uh, lessons so that we can strengthen our own ecosystem. So I would say that for us, we, we are very open about, uh, you know, creating competition. We want to make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, there is greater intra-trade that, you know, uh, as, a, as a continent, we participate and we collaborate with each other so that we can bring further prosperity to the nations of each of our countries. And, and that's the view that we take. Uh, it's not about competition. It is really about how we can build synergies, how we can complement each other. And the same thing I said earlier about South Africa and also in the region. We want a stronger region. We think it will benefit each of us. And, and of course, um, on, on, on our side, I think our prime minister also is doing a lot in terms of diplomacy, is meeting with a lot of leaders as well. And, uh, and we've got our own strategy of how do we want to position Mauritius. Thanks. Uh, you know, before we start this debate, you said that we'd need more than an hour, and you're right, because we left with four minutes just to get some closing remarks on this uh, subject. In fact, two minutes, I'm told. So in this clo very brief closing remark, the topic is Mauritius and Africa, uh, or the gateway to Africa, in 30 seconds, your closing comment. Well, I mean, uh, for the benefit of time, if I may actually uh, say something before, uh, for, for the closing, for the conclusion, it's linked to what he, he said around the identity. Uh, been there as an African uh, from the from the continent because Mauritius is actually like African, and and what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing happening on the island, which I'm actually also advocating for, I'm telling my, my Mauritians uh, brothers and, and friends uh, that in as much as uh, Asia, uh, broadly speaking, and, and, and India in particular is, is part of their history and their DNA, and will always be, uh, the ability to connect Africa with the, ref with the rest of the world is one of the vectors of their future, and they understand that. You know, because they, historically they've been very linked with Asia, you know, connecting Asia with Europe and, uh, and, and America. And now they're understanding gradually that uh, they have a huge potential being, next, being part of actually the next frontier market, which is Africa. Oh, so you agree with Ken there. Yours is a, is a message of unity and integration across the continent. Richard, 30 seconds. I would seconds. go roughly in the same direction to say that <coughs> I think what we need to look at is how does Mauritius as a financial center, as a financial hub, work in tandem with business hubs such as Johannesburg, Nairobi, Lagos, Cote d'Ivoire, Abidjan and all these countries. So working together with is extremely important and then building the continent, helping build the continent by working in tandem. Ronak? So my question is, is uh, Mauritius a small ocean island big enough for India and China? So there's a geopolitical subtext over here in the sense that historically from a military, from a political from a financial perspective, India has had historic links and still very, very uh, views Mauritius as, as a very key country in the Indian Ocean with its naval strategy. But China is also viewing Mauritius as a conduit uh, for trade and investment purposes. Uh, you know, Huawei are there, Bank of China is there. Um, and, you know, they're looking to take advantage of, of the Freeport Zone uh, as well as the, the access that Mauritius has via its, its trade agreements. So interestingly, how Mauritius uses economic diplomacy to balance China and, and India, who are both very interested in the country, I think potentially has a number of long run benefits for, for Mauritius. And Anthony? For me, very simply, on the coal face, um, we have really experienced all the benefits and it's, you know, it's supporting our business. So in all honesty, I can say really it's been an experience for us. It's benefited um, us, our stakeholders, and the, uh, the people that work for us. And uh, Ken, could we get a final comment uh, from Mauritius, particularly as you go out there aggressively uh, to sell uh, the country as an investment destination, but also as a springboard to doing more business on the continent? I think for us, as, as I said earlier, we have come at a crossroad and we would need to make certain strategic choices. 
we know our weaknesses on which we're working on. Uh, we know that we need to invest more in human capacity, in training, so that we can go to that next level. And this is what the government is currently doing, so that we position Mauritius as that platform where we leverage and harness all the opportunities that are coming to our way. And we also firmly believe in the new breed of entrepreneurs that will help us to achieve this vision of a high income economy. Well, thank you uh, so much. And uh, thank you so much to my panelists. Unfortunately, that is uh, all we have time for for this uh, discussion. Just to give the uh, last thank you to uh, my guest, that's Matteo Mandeng, who's the CEO of a Standard Chartered Bank of Mauritius, uh, Richard Arlo, who's the CEO of ABEX, uh, Ronak Gopaldis, who's the director at Signal Risk, and Tony Fun uh, Rensburg, Group CEO of Foresight Holdings. And of course, joining us via Mauritius was Ken Punusami, who is the officer in charge for the Economic Development Board of uh, Mauritius. And it's on that note, we say goodbye to you here from the Johannesburg uh, offices. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Uh, goodbye for now.